This is to the sardonic skeptic. You keep fighting the good fight, brother. Sorry, you don't like to be called brother, I forgot. That's just a habit I got from church days. Little man synth. You should try this shit. It's good. Oh. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I was talking about kind of the formation of my mind as a kid before. And my uncle made a big impression on me, but like I said, he had some pretty fanciful ideas himself. Um, you know, he he was in the Air Force during Vietnam, and he swore he saw UFOs and all that. I wish I could. <clears throat> I would like that a lot. Uh, but he had a lot of conspiracy theories, and they were a lot of fun to listen to. Great stories, and he was a great prankster. The only thing I hated was he liked to tickle, and that's child, you know, he was a great tickler, and I never tickle children. It's child abuse. It was torture, and I remembered it. I hated being tickled. That was the only thing that everybody did that I really hated as a kid. So anybody out there, never tickle a kid. They don't like it, really. It, it is cute, though, uh, <laughs> but I, I never do it. I'll laugh if someone else is doing it. I won't stop them, but... I had conspiracy theory ideas because my uncle was into those. And, you know, it's just one of the eccentricities I guess I have, you know. Um, I had some strange notions about Jesus. And I've read some strange ones too, you know, like, you know, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and how he escaped the crucifixion. And uh, even the, just the two nail theory where they didn't go through his feet. And I had an idea, and it really was. Even young, I had this idea, and I was, God, it scared the hell out of me. So I thought, hey, you know what? What if he's like Harry Houdini? What if he pulled a Houdini? And, you know, the, and Holy Hol Blood Holy Grail suggested, you know, the drug sponge, and they pulled him off the cross. I'm, and he might have been crippled, but he was, he was still alive and, you know, and all that. And interesting, you know, you know, all that Da Vinci Code stuff. But um, I had a different idea. You know, why get nailed at all? And mostly, I mean, I read the Judas uh, Gospel, and they, there's a lot of complicity between Jesus and Judas there. They had an understanding. And like I said, Jesus Christ Superstar, where even Judas was saying to Jesus, hey, I've been your right-hand man all along. And I kind of look in here, and you don't really see where Judas just appears I mean, you don't see, you know, he's going and he's picking Peter and Andrew and, you know, and, but it's like, wait, there's this, Judas is just suddenly mentioned, you know, each time when they named the 12. It's like, maybe he was always there. Maybe he was one of the people that came from John the Baptist's camp. Uh, you know, they said he was a zealot, you know, and that would make sense. They love the hard life. Anyway, then I started looking at the book of John, and that's more provocative, actually. Sure, there's a lot of, uh, you know, double talk in it where they're justifying, but if you read between the lines, there's some interesting stuff going on here. Like in, oh, the end of chapter 6, uh, uh, then Jesus said to the twelve, what about you? Do you want to go away too? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have a message of it. You have the message of eternal life, and we believe we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus replied to them, "Did I not choose the twelve of you? Yet one of you is a devil." He meant Judas, Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, since this was the man, one of the twelve, who was to betray him. Uh, I. I can't help but see a, this whole conspiracy thing. I know I'm I know I'm just being a fox molder here, but this is a little fun, so don't you know, don't take it too serious. Uh chapter thirteen. Uh I had a little talking here, let's see. You know, so the scripture will be fulfilled. Uh yeah. 
you know, here's Jesus, you know, uh, after the washing of the feet and all that. Um, he says, uh, you know, chapter 13, verse 17 down. Uh, now that you know this, blessed are you that behave accordingly. I am not speaking about all of you. I know that the ones I have chosen, wait, I know the ones I have chosen, but the scriptures, uh, but what the scripture says must be fulfilled. He who shares my table takes advantage of me, which comes from Psalms 41.9. So, so they're quoting Psalms. They're always taking advantage of poetry because it's so, you know, wonderfully, you know, nebulous, uh, symbolic and all. You can, you know, like Nostradamus' quatrains, you can read anything into them. It's like looking at clouds, you know, seeing patterns in the matrix. You can only sell those on eBay. Uh, supposedly, David wrote Psalms. I don't necessarily believe that, but uh, didn't he have people sit at his table that betrayed him? This is no prophecy. Anyway, uh, I tell you this now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am he. Sounds like a, setting up a magic trick. I wonder if I should talk to Penn and Teller about this. Uh, in truth, I tell you, whoever welcomes the one I send welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Having said this, Jesus was deeply disturbed and, dis and declared, In truth, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. The, one, the disciples, looking at each other, wondering whom he meant, the disciple Jesus loved was reclining next to Jesus, Simon Peter signed to him and said, Ask who it is he means. So leaning back close to Jesus, this chess, he said, Who is it, Lord? Jesus answered, It is the one whom I give the piece of bread that I dip in the dish. Now that's a little different than the other three stories where they, Judas and Jesus kind of like do this Lady in the Trap moment, you know, where they both dip the bread at the same instant, you know, and that's, oops, oh, I accidentally picked myself. Here, Jesus consciously is going to give the piece of bread to the guy who he's going to send off on a mission. That's the way I read this, even though they say a lot of shit about Judas later. I want to talk about Judas more, but let me finish this one before I go too long. Uh, who is it, Lord? Jesus answered, He is the one whom I give the piece of bread that I dip in the dish. And when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. At that instant, after Judas had taken the bread, Satan entered him. So Jesus put the devil in Judas. Very interesting. He made him his adversary. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going Fox Mulder here. I may have to go into another video. <sighs> At the instant, after Judas had taken the bread, Satan entered him. Jesus then said, What you're going to do, do quickly. He is sending him to do this. He picked him. <sighs> None of the others at the table had... Uh, None of the others at the table understood why he said this, since Judas had charge of the common fund. Some of them thought Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the festival, or telling him to give something to the poor. And these are the witnesses whose second and third hound accounts became this. Pretty damn reliable there. As soon as Judas had taken the piece of bread, he went out. It was night. When he had gone, Jesus said, Now has the Son of Man been glorified, and in him God has been glorified. He sent him on a mission. Sorry, I'm getting paranoid here. If God had glorified in him, God will in turn glorify him in himself. 
I keep thinking he wants to be king. Why do they call him king of the Jews? And I will glorify him very soon, little, uh, very soon, and that's oh, chapter 13, uh, to be continued.